Um, so I'm going to take a step back and go back to Janet Travell. And we were just talking about dry needling acupuncture. We're using similar needles. But I remember from the class, I think it was Carl Lewitt, might have been the first one that kind of discovered the effect of the dry needling from the class, from the stuff. It was 69, 79, where they were doing a study to try to determine what was the most effective pain reliever. And then the control was an, a needle that was empty. And they and uh, they did, I guess, three injections and then did a follow-up one, three, six months. And it turns out that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong in my recollection of this article, um, that the, the control was the one that wound up having the best uh, effect uh, long-term effect compared to the pain medications and um, you know where did the needle get introduced into Travell's studies? Travell actually did mention dry needling in her literature but she referred to dry needling as using a syringe an injection needle without injecting anything uh, so Travell never did the kind of dry needling that people do today with small filament needles. Um, we now have needles that are especially designed for dry needling, so that's that's very different. Uh, David Simons did not yet, uh, did, never did dry needling either. I mean, he never. His first dry needling treatment was in 2006. That was actually documented. I have pictures of it when he was first treated with dry needling because he was so curious. What? How does that feel? In 2006, he was already. Who how old was he? Eighty two, maybe by then, something like that. So Travell talked about dry needling every now and then, but it was very different concept. But it became very clear already in the nineteen forties that possibly the needle had a greater effect than the procaine that Travell used to inject. Um, already in nineteen forty four, Doctor Steinbrocker wrote that it's probably the needle. It's probably a, me a mechanical effect of the needle. The term dry needling was first used in 1947 in the Lancet. So it, it, that term has been around for a while. But you're absolutely right. It was not studied really till 1979 when, when Carl Levitt, who was a Czech physician, I, I have the honor to have known him as well. Um, Carl Levitt did a retrospective study first in just looking like, look, we put all these needles in all these tissues and not just trigger points, but they did needles in everything practically you could put a needle in and he found that 87 percent of people had relief of pain that sometimes lasted for months or forever and uh, that was really the first study that showed like hmm, there's something to that was published in pain one of the most prominent journals in the world even today uh, around the same time a canadian physician chen gun published a paper on people with back pain and he also had developed some form of dry needling using using filament needles and um, was also very successful and that kind of started it a little bit but dry needling really didn't take off till much 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 later uh, in the states maryland was the first state to approve dry needling in 1984. Um, there's one physical therapist in near baltimore who approached the board he said can i do that probably because he had seen travel as well the board said, yeah, we don't have any issues with it. And that, interesting, at that point, we talked about acupuncture. The Acupuncture Society of Maryland was in full agreement with that decision. <laughs> they had no issue with that. They said, oh, that's great. That's wonderful. I, I know people who were on that com on that committee at that time. Um, they're still around. Um, and it was fine. There was not even an acupuncture board at that time because acupuncture really was not popular yet in the States. That really started after this. Uh, Nixon went to China in 1972, and the New York the New York Times reporter got sick in China, and he had treatment with acupuncture and miraculously cured. And he wrote a long article in the New York Times. You can't believe what happened to me. That popularized acupuncture in the state and gave it more impetus than anything else before that. So there were in '84 there was no acupuncture board yet in Maryland. The acupuncture society was very in favor, like oh no big deal. So that came much later. So then slowly but steadily, the studies started coming out. And initially, they were really bad. The, the, even uh, the target of dry needling in, in most schools is trigger points. These little, you mentioned these pesty knots in your shoulder muscles and, and elsewhere in the body. 
Um, now that's expanded a little bit more. There's lots of other things that we can need, though. But the focus, most people are still on trigger points, I think. Um, the research, in, even initially in finding those trigger points, it was so poorly done. The studies were really, really poor. Uh, nowadays, that's so much better. There's still studies that show that dry needling does nothing, like with anything else in science. Um, and that's the nature of science. It depends a lot how you set up the study, how do you measure things. But I can tell you, in the last year and a half, there have been 11 systematic reviews of meta-analysis, which is really the gold standard in figuring out whether something works. 11 of these studies have been published in prominent journals, including our own physical therapy journal. Uh, it has published three of these papers. Some of them are not even out in print, but they're already on the website, uh, showing the efficacy of dry needling. Now, the problem remains that many of the studies are not of great quality, but that's partly because it's really hard to do. Because in, in science, you, the gold standard is to do a double-blind controlled study. Well, it is really next to impossible to blind a patient whether they got needled or not. That makes it really, really difficult. And just because of that simple fact, if you rate quality of studies, the quality immediately is downgraded because, oh, it wasn't truly double blind. So looking at the evidence over the last, I'd say, 20, 25 years, uh, it's overwhelmingly in favor of dry needling now. That is actually something that we need to, to work with that clearly works. And uh, so. So tell me about, you know, why does dry needling work? What is the actual you know, explain it to, how you would explain to a, uh, a patient that mm -hmm. comes into your clinic that. Yeah. If you really, really are honest, we don't know all the answers. Um, but dry needling does change a lot of things that have been objectively documented. Um, when people have these knots in their muscles, we know for sure uh, from research at the National Institute of Health that those areas of the muscles have a lack of blood flow. It's too contracted. The blood just can't get to all parts of the muscle. When there's a lack of blood flow, there's immediately lack of oxygen because the body gets oxygen through the blood flow. When there's a lack of oxygen, the pH of the tissues drops very, very quickly. And that's a big problem for the body. When the pH drops, the body gets very unhappy and all the alarms go off. Because when the pH drops, it's potentially life-threatening. That's how the nervous system, the, the, your systems will interpret that. So the body then immediately, the nervous system sends a lot of chemicals to that area. Chemicals that we use in other places very functionally, but they don't really belong in muscle. Then all these chemicals, neurotransmitters like serotonin and substance P and a lot of other chemicals, then these chemicals cause trouble because they're not supposed to be there and then they cause pain and they contribute to the referred pain as well. So you get this vicious cycle that it gets worse and worse and worse. Um, and then the contracture gets worse, the, the knot gets actually bigger and more spread out, and that's because with the nerve and the muscle interact, so normally when you contract the muscle, your nerve actually releases a chemical acetylcholine that tells the muscle to contract. Well, that system goes totally out of whack as well. We know for sure that needling gets rid of most of these chemicals within a few minutes. They probably get reabsorbed, but what exactly happens, we don't really know. The problem is that the junction between the nerve and the muscle gets restored. There are now studies on, on uh, rodents. So that hasn't been done on people yet. It's actually a little tricky to do it on people. But on, on the rat model, they've been able to show now that when you needle, everything at that what's called motor end plate, where the nerve and muscle conject connects to each other, gets restored, and the knot goes away. And that's why we see clinically for years already that people, uh, patients experience that very quickly. You may have acute low back pain. Uh, or even chronic low back pain, you can treat it in the right locations after, after someone figures out what's really the source of this pain, not where do you feel pain, but what's really the source of it. Many, many patients, we feel instant relief. Uh, if not instantly, it's still the next day, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better. So yeah, that, that's in a nutshell what happens. Okay, it's a little more complicated to reality, but... Yeah, yeah. For, for, our, for our audience, you know, that are non, you know, sure. medical practitioners... Now you spoke about other other conditions other than um, musculoskeletal problems. Uh, mm -hmm. I know that some chronic tension headaches, some temporomandibular joint uh, yeah. problems. What other things 
is uh, dry needling yeah. useful for? Well, I think dry trigger point dry needling, I guess. Yeah, trigger trigger point dry needling is very useful for pretty much every pain condition. There's there's not a pain problem you can mention where there's not papers in the literature that show that dry needling can help. Um, but it's been expanded quite a lot. We do a lot of dry needling for uh, tr for scar tissue, for example. Mm -hmm. Uh, scars tend to be um, tight and maybe painful to touch, and pretty much everyone ignores scars. Like, oh, well, you have a scar, big deal. <clears throat> but when you palpate scars, let's say a C-section scar, like a lot of women will tell you that scar never felt back to normal. It's always these spots on there that hurt. Uh, the panty of underwear, if it happens to touch a scar, may be painful. Even 10, 15 years later, that never really went away. When you see scars like that and you palpate carefully, not just at the scar, but even a little wider area, you often find these little nodules in scar tissue. Now, those are not trigger points. These are really fascial, connective tissue kind of contractures, if you want. Um, and we now needle those with a different needle technique, actually with a slightly different needle where you put the needle in that contracture and then actually turn the needle to put a lot of tension on. So we literally stretch it in the tissues itself. And that's a fairly new development that that's, I mean, we've been doing that maybe for five years now. It's now incorporated in some of our courses. We show other clinicians how to do that properly. And the results of that are, are, are just astonishing, to be honest, it is, it is amazing. Yeah, we I, I learned that I think last year in the mastery we've I it's funny though a lot of the patients I haven't come across where it's like it's bothering me where I want it to be treated because I'll have people come in I'm like oh I can help you with that scar it's a little bit thick you know with you know if it's a past scar current scars you know I'll use a series of different you know grasting or cupping to kind mm -hmm. of help break up the fascial restrictions and get the the scar to sit down um, but yeah. Um, what other, uh, besides the scars, is there anything else? I know maybe migraines, headaches. Um... Sure. So I said every, every pain problem, uh, trigger point therapy will help. Dry needling will help. And as you mentioned, migraines and tension type headaches and cervical genic headaches and headaches that are originated in the neck. One of those systematic reviews I mentioned a little while ago, it's actually a study I participated in. Uh, we looked at what is the evidence in all the literature for dry needling for those headaches, migraines, tension, type headache, and it's called cervical genic headache. And that's one of the papers that just got accepted by physical therapy and the, the journal of physical therapy rehabilitation is called. Um, and that showed really, really very promising results for reducing pain, headache pain, but also reducing disability. So making it more possible for people to function again. And th that in the end, of course, is the most important thing. Now, you mentioned, you said diabetic headaches. Is that what you said? Or? Cervicogenic headaches. Cervicogenic, okay. Yeah, the yeah, uh, only reason why I bring that up is my father recently had um, migraines, and I think it was tied to being undiagnosed diabetic for four years. Mm -hmm. um, and he started out you know, with the aura and stuff. So I wasn't aware of his elevated glucose levels um, at the time, but we, uh, you know, I brought him into the clinic when I, can get him, when I got him up here. He lives about an hour and a half away, and... We tried to do some superficial dry needling along the trigeminal nerve and then also some of the other stuff where I've learned from you, mm -hmm. you know, the SCM, the upper traps, the OCI, the CPSMs, um, you know, even going into, you know, the, the, the muscles of the, you know, the face and the head, um, you know, and I, I've demonstrated the techniques on video. We didn't have a lot of success, but there was, I didn't know at the time, there was underlying that the, that he had this uncontrollable diabetes that was led to, led to that. So that, that's what I thought I heard you say something, but. Uh. No, but you bring up a good point because if you have a patient, let's say with headaches and it looks pretty straightforward, you palpate all these muscles and you're like, oh, you have all these muscles uh, a little bit out of control. So let's, let's try dry needling. And if it doesn't work, if we don't see results in, in. Our clinic, we go by, if in three, four visits, we don't see a drastic change, we're on the wrong track, we're missing something. There must be another underlying source of the misery, of the headache. And that's why you need to go back to the drawing board and say, okay, what else could it be? What, what's causing it? And sometimes it's a medical thing, uh, like diabetes in this case. Uh, I've had patients who had rotator cuff injuries in the shoulders. 
that seemed so obvious to me, like, oh, that has to be about to give. I remember one, one patient quite a few years ago, she had been scrubbing her bathtubs and right after they had pain in that right shoulder and she was right hand dominant, it's like, well, can't really go wrong with that. So I treated her, but she didn't really get better. She got better for a few days and then it started again. Then you got better for it's like what I call the yo-yo effect. It goes up and down, up and down, but you don't really get anywhere in the end. So after a few sessions like that, you kind of have to put a break on things. It's like, what else could be giving you this pain? Now, in that patient, I was rather confused. I had a hard time figuring it out. And pure coincidentally, she had a CT scan of her stomach. And that showed a melon size. I'm not kidding. Mm. It was huge cyst in her liver. And we know, as I said, all organs refer to pain. It is known that the liver refers pain to the shoulder. So she had that cyst before she scrubbed her bathrooms, I have no <laughs> doubt. So that cyst probably really had sensitized all the tissues and the nervous system, but it was still under control. It was below her threshold that she was aware of it. Now, part of that is that the liver does not have any sensors that alarm the person that something is wrong. That's why people have liver cancer. By the time you detect it, it's usually too late. Like most other tissues have sensors, what we call nociceptors. The liver has none of those. So that cyst just kept growing and growing and growing. She had no symptoms. She didn't know that she had no pain in the stomach. Um, so then she did all that scrubbing and she pushed that level over the threshold and all of a sudden she had shoulder pain. But so the scrubbing was the reason it came to the surface, but the cause was the liver cyst. So once the liver cyst was removed, her shoulder pain was gone. She did not need physical therapy. But again, after a few sessions, if it doesn't work, was dry needling really works. If you do it properly, it works. If it doesn't work, you have to say, like, okay, what am I missing? Is this another problem? Is this maybe another system in the body like diabetes? Or is there an, another muscle group? I'm looking at the wrong spot. I think the head that comes from the neck muscles, but maybe it really comes from the muscles here in the forehead. It helps asking your patients, what do you do to resolve the headache? And if they say, oh, I, I have that spot right on my nose, or if I rub that, it goes away. Well, as clinicians, we should listen to that and say, well, ah, maybe it's that teeny little muscle on the face that is a main trigger for the headache and not the biggest one that we see in most other people. So listen to your patient. Um, if it doesn't work, don't keep doing the same thing. Really take a step back. Get other professions involved if you need to. It's like there's something else going on. I can't put my finger on it. And don't be, don't be afraid to communicate with other clinicians, uh, whether it's physicians, whether it's psychologists, whether it's a chiropractor, whether it's an acupuncturist. Um, I refer to all of those professions. And it, it's amazing what you get accomplished when you work as a team. Yeah, I've had, um, you know, usually it's like one of those things of at 30 days someone comes because in Virginia we have direct access and they mm -hmm. can come to us for 30 days. And if they're, we're not seeing any significant results and say, all right, well, what else is going on? We can, you know, if they haven't seen a doctor before, we refer them out. Um, I know that the the dry needling works with, helps with the, uh, with headaches and migraines mm -hmm. and trying to convince people to come in to get that done has been a little bit of uh, trouble. But I've had um, a patient with a condition called Sona. Have you ever heard of that? It's like burst um, migraines. Uh, mm -hmm. um, young man played football and got several concussions and for for years had this problem even debilitating where he couldn't work at times was going to philadelphia to get treatments drug treatments and everything and he came in for back pain and we treated his back you know with some dry needling and then i asked him i said hey do you mind if we give this a shot you know you talked about in your in your history that you have this condition called sona do you mind if we we give the shot. He's like, man, I've been suffering these for, you know, 12 years. If you could help me with that. Um, and lo and behold, uh, it took a while, but, you know, initially we needled him and he got a couple days of relief. And then come back, we needled him, got a couple more. And slowly but surely, it started going a week, yeah. two weeks, three weeks. We get him to the point where he could go almost a month where he would go. And, and it never got completely away. It's there, but it was to this point where he could go back to work and it was manageable. And we also now know, I mean, he lives here in Ashburn and commutes to American University or Catholic American. So he said his condition reduced considerably during COVID because of all the traffic and the driving. 
has been a you know a big thing and we see a lot of that you know a lot of pain problems you know from overuse injuries and stuff like that what is the likelihood if we treat someone that the condition comes back if they you know in your in your you know if they're not doing you know adhering to our advice because it's not just in my practice we don't just come in and do dry needling and say hey high five mm-hmm. see you away there's you know education there's exercises because mm-hmm. you've now regained range of motion increased strength mobility um so what are some things that might prevent dry needling to not seem as successful but it's more on the patient than it is on the practitioner Hmm. that's an interesting question because i'm not so sure that many times it's on the patient I thought honest. we had, I read an article you talked about with the uh, dry needling of the upper traps with people who would go and if they have poor posture and you needle them and then a couple hours sure, later they go back sure. and, and they slouch and the trigger points would come back. Sure, I, I, that's true. If people, let's say if you keep repeating the activity you do that would lead to the dysfunction, you can needle all you want, it's not going away. And that, that's for sure. Um, so if you sit on your computer and you never change your posture, uh, you're always in the same slouch position on the computer with your head far forward and all that. Yeah, you can, there's not much that will work, whether it's dry needle or anything else that's not going to work. Um, I would not say that's because of the dry needling, it's that maybe because of the lack of follow through. But most people, and studies now show that also, that if, if you educate people about their pain, the nature of pain, and what pain's all about, that is probably more important than focusing on a lot of exercise. Uh, the majority of patients do not do exercises. Uh, studies show that over 70% of people do not follow through with your home exercises. <laughs> I think that's an entirely different problem. I think that's partially due to the fact that exercises clinicians give. Again, let's look mostly at physical therapists because, again, I don't like to critique other professions. Mm-hmm. Most of the exercises physical therapy gives are so boring and so non-functional like if you have shoulder pain what's the point in standing in the corner of your room and pushing against the wall uh, we may think it's useful but most patients are like this is so boring what am i what am i doing here and people don't follow through even in more life-threatening situations when people have bypass surgery cardiac bypass surgery they almost died the numbers are the same 70 percent of people who survived that are not changing their lifestyle not exercising so That brings up a whole other thing. I think that physical therapists and and other healthcare providers need to really think what is important in exercise. Um, I have radically changed how I give people exercise. Totally different than what I did 20 years ago. Now I've been a physical therapist for 35 years now, which is a long long time. Um, it's It's kind of amazing actually, I think, but I, I'm a big proponent of exercise with that's really fun that people can do. Um, I'm a big fan of virtual reality exercise. Mm. Get an Oculus at home mm. and or whatever brand you want to use. And we do it in our clinic. We do a lot of actually Evidence in Motion, which is one of the largest uh, physical therapy organizations in the country. I'm speaking at their conference in, in August about it's it's moving beyond walls. like, And really, I'm going to talk about virtual reality and what the science says about using virtual reality to get people with chronic pain to move again, to work again. Because and people say, oh, you're fooling the brain. I said, no, it's actually the other way around. The brain is fooling you and the world you're in now as we are sitting here. If I have chronic back pain, I may be very reluctant climbing up the stairs here. Look, oh, I can't do that my back. I may be very reluctant to tie mm. my shoe because I know my back is going to hurt. Yet when I see that every day in our clinic, when I give you a virtual reality world, I put an Oculus on your head, we have different systems. We even have a multi, an omnidirectional treadmill where you can actually walk in a virtual world. But as soon as you're in a virtual world, your brain forgets everything that happened in the other world. So wow. you're not fooling the brain. The brain is fooling you in the real world. When you're in the virtual world, the, the brain is like, oh, now you see things coming at you. Beat Saber is perfect for chronic back patients because now you have to knock out things out of the air with your hands. You have to squat because things slide at you. You have to duck. You have to do things. You have to go to the right, your left. You have to move. Every single patient we see in our clinic who 
in our world, the real world, says, oh, I can't bend down on my back, my hamstrings, my this, my that, whatever it is. The perception is that it's going to be painful when I do like that. Yet when they're in a different world, in the virtual world, they all move just fine. Hmm. So we don't do that to say, oh, I caught you. <laughs> you can do this. You're a workers comp. You're fooling the system. <laughs> because that's really not the, the point of it. The point is that we need to educate your brain that you can. We need to educate you that you can move. You just have learned in the past, like, oh, I can't do that. But if I had done some dry needling on these back muscles, you know, there's one muscle that's almost always involved called quadratus lumborum. You needle that muscle and then people say, oh, well, it feels so much better, but they're still scared to walk, to move. You put them in a different reality and they just move just fine. It is really amazing to see. Again, that leading pain journal I mentioned, the journal Pain, just had an article about that uh, last year about the update on virtual reality and pain. And I think that's where we need to go with physical therapy. We need to have fun in our clinics. We, not have to, we should stop giving people boring exercises. It doesn't make any sense to me. And again, there was a radical change in my world once I got introduced to that. Um, in our clinic, we just have a lot of fun. And a lot of stuff you can do at home, it's not very expensive. Um, like doing a plank exercise, you know, like, oh, you need to work on your core. Well, a plank exercise is super boring. Getting your elbows and keep your back straight while you're on your toes, well, that gets boring very quickly. Now, we use a little app for that. We have a little wobbly thing, it's commercially available, um, and people play a computer game, a video game, while they're planking. And people who have never done that before manage to plank for 10 minutes for the very first time they do it because they're not focusing on my because oh, I can't do that, my back, my stomach, my neck, whatever, my feet, my toes, whatever hurts. They want to hit that target on a little app on my phone. It's an external focus of exercise. So I think that dry needling is going back to that only works when you package it in something much bigger than just dry needling. If we just do dry needling, you know, that's kind of a waste of your time, I think. Yeah, you can get people out of pain. But if you want to really make changes, I think you have to convince people. People have to convince themselves that they can do whatever they want, that there are no limitations, that you don't have to worry about picking up something heavy, that you need to get into what we call progressive loading. Yeah, there, there's so many myths in the world, like, oh, you have to bend with your back, pick up, lift things with your back straight. There's no research that supports that at all. So I used to teach that too to my patients. Look at the, heavy, the, the strong men competitions. They bend their backs completely and pick up the heaviest things in the world. Things that I wouldn't dream of picking up because I have not loaded my body. I have not slowly but steadily strengthened my body to get to that point. But there's so many things that we as clinicians, I think, put restrictions on patients rather than letting people exp explore. You can move just fine. And if you take virtual reality to do that, why wouldn't we do that? It's very cheap. It's very fun. And uh, we have two of those systems in our clinic. Actually, we have more. You can do it even in combination with, with uh, the rowing machines. Most rowing machines that have apps that totally interact with virtual reality. So you're not just sitting on a boring rowing machine. You're actually going down the Grand Canyon in your virtual world. And I guarantee you, when you see that, people all of a sudden have much more fun rowing. You're not staring at a stupid wall, like, oh, I'm rowing, I'm rowing, it's so boring. So dry kneeling to me is just a part of what we do as physical therapists. And, and people go about these different ways, and that's totally fine. I would think that telling anyone that this is the only way to do things, I think that shows that you really don't understand how complex we are. The, we, can, we can respond to so many different ways that, that we can get better. Um, experiencing that you can, yeah, the Nike slogan, just do it. It's easy to set, but once people can experience that, they actually can do it by playing a game. In, in our former clinic, unfortunately we had to close because of COVID, because it was characterized as a fitness center, so we couldn't really get in. We had a 30 foot trampoline. Every chronic pain patient is on that trampoline. And you guess what? You know, within two minutes, they forget their back pain because it's so much fun. You can walk in it, you bounce, like, well, we throw Frisbees at them and they forget that, oh, I need to catch the Frisbee. All of it becomes competitive. Now we do that after dry needling. We start usually with some dry needling to get the pain better under control, but then we show people 
there are no limits you can do whatever you want but you may have to slowly increase your strengthening your progressive loading if you really want to run that big hike again and when your next vacation or whatever you need to get a little stronger because you're so deconditioned because you've had pain for that long so i think it's a lot more it's very fun i mean i as i said i've been a therapist for 35 years and I have no signs of burnout whatsoever. I have way too much fun with my patients figuring out what to do.